Okay, praise the Lord and uh, welcome everyone to the last session on our study of uh, the publication on laying the axe to the root, right? So the first session was laying the axe to the root of self. Okay, second one. Jealousy. Third one. Pride. And the last one is lust. Okay. Uh, welcome to all our um, online students. Thank you for uh, joining our class. We'll just uh, pause for a word of prayer. Everyone, let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. Your word teaches us, corrects us, trains us, and rebukes us in righteousness and holiness. And we pray, Father, that even as we look into these various aspects of our own lives where these things can be so subtle, can rob us of our joy, or rob us of our peace, of fulfilling your purposes for our lives. We pray, God, that even as you, even as we hear from your word, even as you're teaching us, even as you lay your finger on these various areas of our lives, that God, we would be people who would um, confess and repent and turn from our sinful, wicked ways so that, God, we can be your uh, royal priesthood. We can be your people uh, who are uh, holy before you, God, because that is your mandate. That is your standard for us, that we should be holy as you are holy, God, so that you can pour out your anointing on our lives. Uh, and we can be people who are powerful here on the earth to represent you, to extend and build your kingdom. We pray that even as we listen to your word, that you would open our hearts and minds. And God, that we would uh, follow, God, what you are asking us to do. We thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're going to be uh, studying uh, the last chapter, laying the axe to the root of lust. What is lust? What is lust? Something that is an uncontrollable, uh, unreasonable, excessive, and immoderate desire. Something that is it's not un cannot be controlled, which is excessive uh, desire, passion, longing, a craving, and a yearning for something. It can be anything. We will look at. Uh, all of those things uh, in, a, in some time. But it's basically our desires, which is, um, you know, unreasonable, uncontrollable, excessive, and something that is uh, a craving or a longing for something. So is desire wrong? Is desire wrong? No, we should have desire, right? Yes, it's not uh, wrong to have desires. It is good to have desires. We need to have good, healthy desires. And if you don't have desires, what happens? What happens if you don't have desires? Sorry? We get, we get stuck somewhere, yes. You know, life is like, chalta hai. we'll do anything, whatever comes our way. We are not motivated. We don't have that passion uh, that longing to do uh, anything in life or fulfill what God has called us to do, right? So we need to have desires because desires motivate us. And the Bible also says that we need to have desires. Desires for what? What does the Bible tell us we need to have desires for? Sorry? Sorry? You need to speak loud because I can't really hear. Gifts of the Holy Spirit, okay? To the Holy Spirit. Okay? Desires for? Desires. Desires. Align with God, okay? I'm looking for a word, uh, for purity, okay? I'm looking for two P's and one W. Three words which start with two P's and one W. Desire for His presence, His power, and His word right we need to have desire for his presence his um uh, his power and his word and psalms 37 verse 4 says delight yourself in the lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart so there's nothing wrong in desiring things good things things that are in accordance with god's will because he gives it to 
us. Okay, look at what uh, Mark chapter. We're not. Okay, Mark chapter eleven verse twenty four. It says that whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Okay. So uh, sorry, online students, we can't uh, project um, PPT for you. So you can just. Uh, look at your, um, you know, the PDF file that is available. Um, but I have just pre uh, prepared some PPTs. Our uh, in-person students can follow that. So here we, it says that before we pray, we need to have desire for good things, right? We need to have desires for good things. And God answers our desires. Now, the problem arises when we have desires for the wrong things and when these wrong desires become uncontrollable and excessive okay now how does the bible define lust the bible defines lust as covetousness or inordinate what is inordinate it is excessive unreasonable affection when you have excessive unreasonable affection or you're coveting you know we look at coveting covetousness in a bit Okay, so covetousness and excessive and in, uh, in unreasonable affection is what the Bible defines as lust. And we know that lust is not the way of, it's not from the Father, it's not from the Lord, it's not from our God, but lust is the way of the world. Okay, lust is the way of the world and the way of the world is to fulfill the desires of the flesh and the mind okay so the world's uh, philosophy or the way the world uh, uh, you know uh, goes is you know whatever makes you happy whatever makes you feel good whatever is excites you just go ahead and do it don't look at it whether it's right or wrong if it's exciting it makes you happy it makes you feel good just go ahead and do it and we know that you know we were part of the world once yes or no okay Yes, we were all part of the world once. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 uh, says that we were all part of the world, okay, because we were in sin. But when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, what happens? We are no longer controlled by the things of this world. We should be dead. We are dead to sin. We are dead to this world, you know, and we no longer must be dominated by the things of the world world we no longer should be dominated by lust yes we live in a world where there is corruption where there is moral decay in this world there is anywhere and everywhere when you look at there is lustful things all around us whether we look at a billboard sign whether you look at the newspaper that comes on uh, you know at our doorstep uh, you just go onto the internet you're searching for something there are you know, pop-up things that are, you know, um, images that are uh, sexually perversive, nudity that is there everywhere. But, you know, we live in a world that is corrupted, but we are asked not to be controlled by the things of this world, okay? We don't have to be caught up in the strap, the corruption of this world, okay? We can overcome it. Now, if you look at um, the scripture verses, I just put it on the on the uh, in the PPTs, since we have the lack of time and there's a lot of content to go through, I'll not be reading every scripture passage, but then it's there in the PDF. You can read it um, after the session is over. Okay, so uh, we don't have to be caught up. We need to overcome the things of this world. And the good news is that God has given us His word. Right, Second Peter chapter one. Verse 4 says that, you know, we have this great and precious promises through which we can escape the corruption of this world and we can be partakers of God's divine nature. So once we accept the Lord Jesus as our Lord and Savior, his nature becomes our nature because we become one with him, right? And also that we have escaped the corruption of this world world so when can desire for wrong things become uncontrolled and excessive when can desires for the wrong things become uncontrolled and excessive that is what we said is lust okay when is it is when we desire for things 
uh, wrong things that are stirred up within us. Okay, when things that are wrong things that are stirred up within us, and when these wrong things are stirred up within us, you know, it weakens our will to refuse it. It weakens our will to overcome it, and we find ourselves giving into it. We find ourselves becoming a slave of that. So, when can you desire? For something that is wrong or when can something that is wrong be stirred up within us and when can it weaken our will and when can we come to a point where we refuse uh, that desire and we give in to it and we can't overcome it it's when the stirring up of these wrong desires you know uh, take place when we don't guard our imaginations our thoughts are, um, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, are the, uh, the things that we watch, um, the information that we are exposed to. I said that there is a lot of information that we are exposed to in this world, which is not pure, that is unholy, that is sexually tainted. You know, we are exposed to a whole lot of things, but we need to guard our eyes. We need to guard our eyes because when we look at it, those become thoughts, imaginations, and those informations come into our mind. And that is why the Bible says that we need to take every thought captive to our Lord Jesus Christ. That means every thought should come under the submission and the lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Also, some of the some people can influence our thoughts and our imaginations you know we can easily give in to gossips we can be uh, backbiting uh, listening to jokes listening to things that are not pleasing that is not holy so all of these things can come into our minds as imaginations and thoughts and then we find ourselves you know giving into it because it weakens our will and it we are no longer able to control it but that controls us and that becomes you know a lustful uh, passion and that becomes uh, sinful so we need to take every thought idea imaginations uh, captive and under the lordship of our lord and savior jesus christ and when these desires become a stronghold or desires become so strong that it leads us away even from the truth and we can nullify the truth that's when we get into sin and that's when we can become some bondage and we can become slaves to these things that hold us and control us now the devil cannot cause us to sin all the devil does is just plant one thought one imagination one wrong idea into your mind and that is more than enough because we start you know thinking about it mulling over it and we just it becomes such a stronghold that we are not able to overcome it okay so all the devil does is he just stirs up our passions by putting in a thought a desire you know, an imagination and these control us and it, you know, weakens our will to resist that. And that is what leads us into temptation or that is what the Bible calls as temptation. Okay. Look at what James chapter one verses 13 and 16 uh, says. Now it's very interesting here in verse 14, it says that each one is tempted when we are drawn away by our neighbor's passion or the devil's passion whose passion our own passions and our own desires so you can't blame the devil that he's leading you away and drawing away your passions and your desires but here it very clearly states in verse 14 that when we are drawn away by our own desires and our own passions and we are enticed by that enticed means when we are caught in a net and we can't over commit okay so it's not the devil's desires that is tempting you it's not your neighbor's desires that is tem tempting you but it's your own desires and your passions and that draws us away from god that draws us away from the truth and entices us and then it weakens our will to resist it resist whatever you're watching thinking doing indulging in uh, sexual addictions, you know, pornography, 
smoking, drinking, whatever it can be, you know, it just entices you and you are not able to overcome it. You're not able to resist it because you become a slave of it. Now, in the previous session, you looked at this verse in 1 John chapter 2, uh, verses 16 and 17, okay? So 1 John chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, you know, um, mentions three things. What are the three things? Hello, everyone alive here? <laughs> yes, what are the three things? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It's okay to speak up in class when you are asked, so you're not just hearing my voice. Okay, so three things, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So we're going to look at these two things, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. Now, what is the lust of the eyes? Lust of the eyes basically means you're gratifying what we see um, and what we uh, desire, what we want to possess, the things that we want to possess, the things that we see, you know, we desire to have it. Okay, that is the lust of the eyes. What is the lust of the flesh? When we do something bad with your flesh, okay? It basically means to gratify the sinful desires of your flesh, giving in to sinful desires on your flesh. So the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes basically means things that gratify the sinful desires of the body, okay? And the lust of the eyes basically means gratifying what we see. Okay, desiring it for ourselves, wanting to possess it, wanting to have it, wanting to enjoy it. Okay, now how do we identify the manifestations of the root of lust? Or how does the root of lust manifest itself, make itself known? So we're going to look at a few things about the manifestation of the lust of the flesh. And then we will look at the manifestations of the lust of the eyes. Okay. So basically, manifestations mean symptoms, signs, displays. What are the symptoms, signs, displays of the lust of the flesh? How do you know that you are, you know, having the lust of the flesh and you have to overcome it? Sometimes we're so ignorant. We don't know. We're taking it by surprise before it destroys our life. How do we know that, you know, we have the, um, the lust of the uh, eyes or the lust of the flesh? So we are looking at some symptoms we're looking at some indicators and we're going to look at some uh, signs that display the lust of the flesh first. And then we will look at the manifestations of the lust of the eyes. All of you are with me? Yes. Okay. So the first one is uncontrollable desire for substances, including good food. Now you must be wondering how can desire for good food, you know, be something, a manifestation of the lust of the flesh. Okay, we look at it. Now, what is this uncontrollable desires for substance? Substances means alcohol, drugs, cigarettes, smoking, yes, okay. Even, um, you know, some of you from North India would constantly chewing, uh, Pan, gutka, and all of those uh, things. It's become, it's become such, a, I, I've gone to North India and everywhere you see you, it's on the walls, on the street, it's just red, 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 red. And now it's become so much part of the lifestyle like Bangalore, which I'm not just liking it because we have so many people from North India here. Anytime you just see them, they are having that in their mouth. And that is such an addiction, okay? So we're talking about those kind of substances and also good food. Okay, so all of these uncontrollable desires for all of these things that we mentioned is basically addictions and also uncontrollable desire for good food is called gluttony. The Bible calls that as gluttony. So is it wrong to desire to eat good food? No. Yes, an excessive, excessive uncontrollable desire for food, always thinking about food, always wanting to eat um, food, okay? Look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 and 13 says. It says, everything is lawful for me, but not everything is helpful. Everything is lawful, but not everything is beneficial. 
Not everything is going to help you. You can say it's okay to do it, but it's not going to benefit you. It's not going to um, help you. Okay, and it says in verse 13, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So both, are, both of these things are lust of the flesh and Jesus came to lay the ax at the root of these two. Amen. So if you identify this this morning, we'll have some time to repent and to confess that and to overcome these um, uh, sins. Okay. Now, why do we say that, um, you know, uh, gluttony or a, a uncontrollable desire for food is sinful? Because uh, an example we can see is in the Old Testament. Now, when the Israelites were journeying from Egypt uh, to the promised land, the Lord said that's a land uh, flowing with milk and honey, okay, a land of abundance. And uh, suddenly these people had an uncontrollable, excessive craving for, for food, meat, right? There was an uncontrollable, excessive craving for meat. And this desire became so intense that it became like a lusting for meat. And why was it sinful? Because there was such a great craving that became so lustful. And also because these people, the Israelites, were at the center of fulfilling uh, God's glorious and divine purpose and plan for their lives, okay, for the people of Israel. But here are these people, instead of following and pursuing God's plan and purpose for their life, what were they doing? They were lusting for good food. They had an intense craving, a satisfying, a, de a desire to satisfy their appetites, their bodily appetites, their um, carnal um, appetites. And that took precedence or that became more important than the, you know, fulfilling the plan and the purpose that God had for them. And what did the Israelites end up doing when they were craving for meat? The Bible says that they were tempted, ended up tempting God. If you look at Psalms chapter 78, verses 14 to 32, and if you read Psalm 106, verses 9 to 15, it says they ended up tempting God or testing God, and that was sinful. And God gave in to their craving, but we know some of them even died. Okay, so that is the first thing, uh, you know, uncontrollable desire for substance and for good food. The second one, the manifestation of the lust of the flesh, is compulsive habits and or desires. Compulsive habits or desires. Now, some of you long to sleep for 14 hours, 12 hours. You know, what is a good sleep time? Eight hours is good. Okay, seven, seven to eight. Some of you ask. Some of you said 12 or 14 hours is <laughs> okay. Some of us crave to sleep 12 to 14 hours. Or some of you feel that you it is necessary, mandatory for you to watch a movie every week or at least in a month. Or for some of you, it is like shopping every week. You have to buy something new every week. Or some of you, your spouse has to give you a gift every week month otherwise you go with a long face you don't give him food or you don't uh, you know provide for the family whatever it is okay so when these habits become very compulsive habit a desire then it's the lust of the flesh okay and whatever controls us we become slaves of it we become a bondage to it and that becomes an addiction so we need to even look at this area. So even as I'm speaking about these things, I just don't want you to think of it as a lecture, but this is something that we're speaking into our own lives. So if these are areas that you have to renounce and repent, you can think of it and in the end we'll pray about uh, these things. The third one is sexual perversion. Okay, Our, our uh, sexuality was de is designed by, created and designed by God. Okay, God designed sex and sex is pure and holy within the framework or the context that God purposed it to be that is within marriage. Okay, so God created it. He designed it to be within marriage. So sex is holy and pure because it is ordained, designed by God. However, unnatural sexual acts and forms of sexual perversion that God did not design is unacceptable before him and is something that he cannot stand, 
okay? And we know that many of us who are believers, born again, tongue-speaking believers can be in sexual bondage and perversion. Nobody sees our minds. Nobody looks at what we are watching, what we are thinking, but God knows he sees. And all of this is unacceptable in God's sight because it is not created by him. And if you read, I want you all to read Romans chapter 1 later on, verses 18 to 32. Here it clearly warns us that homosexu homosexuality yeah. is wrong, it's not designed by God, and hence it is not acceptable by God and it is a sin. Okay, so we cannot say that homosexuality is acceptable when it is not acceptable in the sight of God. Now, homosexuals think that. You know, this is how they have been created. This is a way of life. But the Bible makes it very clear that it is not something that God created. And that's why if you look at Romans chapter 1, verse 32, or verse 24, so it says, God gave them up to their uncleanliness. So God is saying, hey, this is what you want to think. This is what you want to do. This is what you think is right. I give you up. You know, go in your own ways. You know, he gave them up the lust of their hearts to dishonor their own bodies among themselves. And look at verse 32 where it says that God is a God of righteousness. He's a righteous judge. He will judge. And it's amazing to read there because he says not only those who practice such things, sexual perversion, homosexuality, premarital sex, immorality, adultery, you know, uh, incest, all of these are unacceptable. And those who practice such things deserve, what does it say there? Deserve what? Verse 32, death. Not only those who practice it, but look, it says, but also those who approve of those who practice it. So if you approve of immorality, adultery, um, you know, um, uh, premarital sex, um, sexual perversions, homosexuality, the consequences, you're approving it of it, and that is deserving of death, okay? Another form, other forms of sexual perversion is fantasizing sexual experiences. You need, you know, you're not there doing the act, but you're just in your room, you're even seated, you're listening to a lecture, but in your mind, you have all filthy, dirty, perversive sexual thoughts, Okay, and that is also lust and that is also sin. Okay, and that is sexual perversion, fantasizing. Okay, just, you know, lying down on your bed and there's a movie scene just running in your mind, which is fully sexually perverted and that is dishonoring in God's sight. Also, masturbation is a bondage, another uh, example of sexual perversion and the lust of the flesh. And, you know, if you, if you are indulging in this, then you need to ask God to set you free because God wants to deal with these issues in your life, okay? So these are a few things about the manifestations of the lust of the flesh. Now we look at the manifestations of the lust of the eyes, okay? Pornography. Um, I don't know if all of you know this word pornography. Pornography is basically, uh, you know, uh, looking at sexually perverted images, videos, uh, nude images, um, and, you know, that is to give you sexual uh, excitement um, uh, uh, and also like an entertainment for you, okay? And many of them who are believers, born again, can also be under this addiction uh, look at what 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22 says. Abstain from every form of evil. Every form of evil. So, you know, I know that, you know, in the world that we live in, we are just bombarded by a lot of sexually implicit images and uh, movies and, you know, serials. I know nowadays, if you look at even advertisements, everything that sells has a sexual connotation and it's so sad even the way people dress nowadays you know it is really pathetic so everything from movies to songs to you know you're surfing the internet or you're looking at youtube videos everything has some sexually rated or, or pictures or connotations and it's very important for us you know i know when we're looking at you know surfing the net something can just come in but we don't indulge get into it look at it but just close our eyes, you know, press the into button and get rid of it. And, 
you know, just ask God to cleanse your mind every day. It's so important. So the second one is filthy thoughts and immoral fantasies. I already to uh, talked about this in the, in the previous point. Uh, you know, we're having a lot of filthy thoughts, immoral fantasies, sexually fantasizing in our minds. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 tells us what are the things that we need to think about. He's, Paul says, whatever is true, right, noble, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things. So if a thought comes to your mind, you need to ask yourself, is this true, right, noble, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy? If it's not, ask God to remove it, throw it out. Okay, do something that will engage your mind and will you will not continue thinking about those things. The third one for um, the manifestations of the lust of the eyes is fascination towards good looking men and women. So shouldn't we look and admire good looking men and women? What do you all think? Yeah, it's good to look at people and say, oh, wow, you know, he looks handsome or she looks so beautiful, you know, observe things. But here it's always, you know, your eyes are always glued to, you know, whether it's for us as women looking at men, handsome men, or whether it's men looking at handsome, uh, beautiful ladies, you know, and fantasizing, thinking about them, you know, have sexual uh, thoughts about them in your minds, you know. Um, and that is lustful thought and that is sin, okay, and a manifestation of the lust of the flesh. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 28. He takes adultery to the next level. You know, he says that even if you look at a woman lustfully in her eyes, it's not only for men, for women, women even for us when it comes to men. When we look at men or women lustfully with our eyes, we've already committed the sin of, we committed the sin of adultery, yes, okay? So we need to take control of our minds, what we are uh, uh, be fascinated by and, you know, um, draw a line where we are, you know, yes, admiring people, but where we take it to. The fourth one is covetousness. What is covetousness? It's a desire for what somebody else has okay now is it wrong to covet what somebody else has if somebody is flowing in the gifts of the spirit is it wrong to covet that yes or no no if somebody is able to quote scripture passages like that is it wrong to covet that gift no if somebody is um, able to overcome temptation overcome their sinful habits it's is it wrong to covet that kind of lifestyle and live a holy life? No. But here we're talking about covetousness in terms of worldly desires, worldly passions, worldly things. And the Bible warns us that covetousness is, covetousness is Colossians chapter 3 verse 5. What is covetousness? It's idolatry. What is idolatry? Hello, what is idolatry? Huh? Worshipping the idols, yes. Sometimes we think idolatry is just bowing down before idols and you're like, hey, no, I don't worship any idol. See? But idolatry can be any idol that takes the place of God in your life. It can be food, it can be sleep, it can be some person that you love, it can be sex, it can be ca your careers, it can be your job, it can be sports, it can be religion, it can be any form of worship, anything that takes the place of God in your life is idolatry, anything. Even desiring to watch movies, your YouTube videos, constantly engaging, you know, Facebook or, you know, ch going to chat rooms, constantly chatting with people, whatever you're indulging in, all those can be forms of idolatry. So whatever takes the place or the center place of God in your life is an idol. And what is the last commandment that God gave us among the Ten Commandments? What is the last commandment? You shall not covet, right? You shall not covet in short Okay, so, um, and even Jesus warns us about, be, uh, warning, warns us about covetousness. It says, Luke chapter 12, verse 15, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he 
possesses. Okay. The next uh, manifestation of the lust of the eyes is desire for money, power, fame, position, and influence. So is it wrong to desire these things? Yes, no, is it wrong to desire these things? No, but when it becomes excessive, it's good to have money, power, fame, position, uh, influence. You can use all of that to extend God's kingdom. You can use all of that to build God's kingdom. But these are just tools God has given to us. But it should not become something that we are, is our affection or controlling us. And that is what leads us into temptation. Look at what um, Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 says. Okay, so there are three things here portrayed in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Okay, three folds of temptation, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Okay, so what did Satan do? Just show the fruit, and what was the fruit? It was pleasing to the eyes. Okay, lust of the eyes. And Eve saw that the food was, that the fruit was good for food, so the lust of the flesh. And it was good to make one wise, the pride of life. And that was what gave into her temptation. So all Satan did was just show the fruit. And that was enough to lead, uh, you know, Eve into temptation. And that is enough for all of us to get tempted and to fall into sin and to go away from uh, God. So we must guard ourselves from this intense desire for money, fame, position, influence, um, etc. Okay. The next one, the sixth one is worldliness. You know, we shouldn't be attracted or fascinated by the things of the world. The things of the world makes us what? Friendship with the world makes us enemies with God. Yes, makes us enemies with um, um, God. Okay. So there's nothing wrong in enjoying these things, but when it becomes uncontrollable desires, uh, and when we are in love with the world, the love with the things of this world, then we cannot be friends with God. Okay. The seventh one is greed. Okay. What is greed? What do you think is greed? Huh? Too much of desiring for more. Yes, desiring for more. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 says, The love of the money is the root of all evil, for some have strayed away from their faith in greediness and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So is desiring to make money to be rich, is it wrong? No, it's not wrong. You know, love for money is not wrong. But the love, uh, sorry, um, money in itself is not wrong, but craving for it, love for it is, yes, is wrong. So we pray and ask God to bless us with more money so that we can extend his kingdom, you know, pay our bills, uh, give into the gospel uh, in the building of the kingdom of God to save souls. But at the same time, we shouldn't be craving for bigger cars, bigger homes, more wealth, greater success, uh, you know, wider ministry, greater uh, recognitions, higher positions in life, because all of this bigger and greater can come very subtle, like we are claiming for God's blessings, we are asking for more of his blessings, but actually it is getting us into, you know, lusting after the things of this world. And when it becomes excessive, uncontrollable, we begin to depart from godly pursuits, from, you know, pursuing God, God uh, pursuing God in a holy way, desiring for things in a godly way, and then it becomes, we come to a place uh, where it becomes lustful and dangerous. That is why Paul is writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. And he says, godliness with, anyone knows godliness with? Contentment is great gain. Okay, so be content with what you have. So when you have, when you're godly and you're content with God has given you, that is great gain. I'm going to talk about youthful lust. Some of you are youths here. You know, 2 Timothy verses 2, chapter 2, verse 22, Paul says, you know, free from youthful lust. And what does it ask us? What does he ask us to pursue? Faith, love, peace, for those who call upon God with a pure heart. Okay. So that means, you know, not pursuing ungodly music, online gaming, chat 
chat portals, you know, internet, chat rooms, all of those things. You know, sometimes we don't know what is right, what is wrong. When you don't know what is right and what is wrong, it's best not to get into those things. Don't give the enemy a foothold in your life. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 22 says, abstain from every form of evil. Okay, so these are some of the things about the manifestations of the lust of the lust of the eyes. Thank you. Now we look at what are the consequences of the root of lust. You know, lust chokes the word of God in our lives. Okay, how does it choke God's word in our lives? Look at what Jesus says in Mark chapter 4 verse 19. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things entering in choke the word and we become unfruitful. So you can be sitting in Bible college, you can be listening to God's word day in and day out, you can go to church every day, you can be reading your Bible, but you, when you are controlled by uh, the sin of lust, whatever God is trying to speak to you does not come to pass, it will not work in your life, your life will be unfruitful because all of these things are going to choke the word of God in your life. You will just read it, but it will not bring about correction and rebuking, okay? Also, the other consequence is it brings in bondage, strongholds. Um, we know that in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, uh, Paul says, whatever you present your bodies to as a slave to sin, you become a slave to sin. If you present your bodies as a slave to righteousness, you become a slave to righteousness or to God, okay? So you can either make a choice to be a slave or to be free. Whom the sun sets free is free in deed. All of you are free, but you can choose whether you want to be a slave or whether you want to live in freedom, okay? Last also brings destruction to our souls and our bodies. First Peter chapter 2 verse 11 says, abstain from all fleshly lusts which wars against your soul. So the flesh, fleshly lust wars against our soul, our minds, our wills. It weakens our soul, minds, and wills. And we're not able to concentrate. Uh, we don't have the ability to remember. And the intellect God has given us is also affected you. So some of you might be saying, hey, I can't concentrate. You know, uh, my mind keeps wandering somewhere else. You know, or I'm not able to remember things. Whatever I read, I, I forget. It's because that you're continually giving your life or your mind, you know, to the things of the flesh. And that is what is warring against your soul. It's weakening your mind, your ability to remember, and your intellect. Okay? And um, look at what First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 says. It says, uh, every sin that a man does is outside his body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. So when you are indulging in sexual immorality, you're destroying your own body, you're violating your own body. Now, um, we'll just take a deeper look at the problem of lust. Okay, in the, in the beginning, we said that, you know, uh, we are drawn away by our own lust and we are led into temptation. But also lust can uh, come also as a result of a wounded spirit. Now, if some of you are grieved with the loss of a loved one or you're going through divorce or some financial bankruptcy or financial problem or you're facing bankruptcy, whatever, you know, you're going through your life, you know, you get indulged in substance abuse like drinking, alcohol, you know, or sexual immorality because you are wounded in your soul. So you need to see what is causing you to get tempted and you need to work on that. Now, some lusts are demonically energized, okay? Now, it's, um, please listen up carefully. You know, there are different demonic spirits that energizes different sinful behavior patterns like unclean spirits that Im bring about immoral lifestyles. There are perversive spirits that lead us from all, uh, you know, the truth and into the ways of this world. Then there is this, the unclean spirits or the demonic spirits that cause us to harlotry. There is spirit of bondage that 
makes us bondage to sin and uh, habits and addictions. There is a demonic spirit that energizes disobediences and rebellion to the truth in God's word. And there is a spirit that brings about, you know, love for the things of this world. There is also demonic spirits or seducing spirits that, you know, traps us and leads us into sexual fantasies or the things of this world. So there are different demonic spirits that, you know, operate around this world. And it's sad that believers can also give an entrance to these spirits. Now, you can be a strong believer, born again, you know, speaking in tongues, but you can also be, uh, you know, um, uh, having a stronghold of demonic spirits. Of course, Satan can't possess you, okay, because you have the Holy Spirit as you are born again, but, you know, it can become a stronghold where these demonic spirits can energize you. So what are strongholds? Basically, strongholds are thought patterns in your mind where we become tolerant to sin, where we have compromised, we have rejected the truth, and we have given a place to Satan to influence us and influence our minds. It becomes a stronghold where we cannot break it, okay? So what can we do, you know, to overcome or break these strongholds? Receive the truth, read God's word, let the truth set you free, okay? Confess, repent, and renounce those sinful habits, and then make no provisions for the flesh, okay? So that is very, very important, and... Um, the important truth here is that, you know, um, like I said, you know, um, when our desires and our passions reach to a level, you know, where it's uncontrollable, the demons energize it, take control of it, and becomes a stronghold, a strong bondage. Becomes like a fort, you know, where you can't break through, okay? And so this... Um, this uh, morning, we'll just um, all just rise up to our feet, stand up, and um, we'll just, you know, look into our own lives, examine our own lives now. All of you, whether you're in person, online, just request all of you to close your eyes, pause. We looked at so many different areas in our lives where we can we could have opened the doors for the demonic spirits, for unclean spirits, perversive spirits, sexually energized spirits, demonic spirits to come into our lives. And these have become strongholds. We looked at so many areas. I don't know what area you are suffering in, whether it's food, sleep, Desire for more of money, positions, possessions, power, fame. You know, there are idols in your life which is taken the place of God, where it is, is it a person, it's your career, it's your job, craving for riches, substance abuse, sexual addictions, pornography. This morning, God is speaking to you. The Holy Spirit is a Holy Spirit. He sanctifies us. He cleanses us. So this morning, just say, God, you see my life. You know me where I am. You know the areas where I have gone away, I've transgressed God. This uncleanliness, this impurity, no one knows. You know it, God. Say, God, this morning, I confess, I repent. I give my mind, my thoughts, my imaginations, my sexual appetites, my desire, craving for things, whatever it is, name it. Say, God, I lay it at your feet, God, this morning. I break those strongholds in the name of Jesus. Say, God, I just, when I say I repent, I break those strongholds in your name, the name of Jesus. I consider it void and nullified. 
I shut those doors and the enemy has no access to it in the name of Jesus. Father, this morning, we just commit ourselves into your hands, God. You, you've called us to be holy as you are holy. That is the mandate, that is the standard that you have set for our lives. This morning, God, even as we come into your presence, you know the areas in our lives where we are in bondage, God. We are slaves to sin, to immorality, God, to uh, pervasive sexual thoughts, unclean thoughts, desires, and lustful things, God. We just bring it before you. Your throne of grace this morning father and god we pray in the name of jesus all of those strongholds all of those demonically energized spirits and those that we have opened to the evil one we break it in the name of jesus we break those strongholds we break those addictions god we break those cycles and patterns and desires for lustful and sexual things in the name of jesus and god we just cover that in the blood of the lamb we shut those doors god that you have we have opened and given access to the evil one we shut it in the name of jesus and we declare god that satan has no access to those areas in our lives we pray god that you would you would shut those even as you shut those doors we seal it in the blood of the lamb and we pray, God, that you would cleanse our minds, you would cleanse our, our wills, our emotions, God, our sexual appetites, Father, everything we pray that you would cleanse, you would sanctify us, God, because you are the refiner's fire, you are the launder's soap, God, you would cleanse us and purify us so that we can be those honorable vessels, God, we can be those vessels fit for the master's use, where you can pour out your anointing upon us God so that we can go forth and do your great exploits for you God we can build your kingdom father God we just want to pray father that even as you have set us free we consider us free uh, uh, dead to those sins Father God and we, we we declare that we have the nature of Christ and we declare that the nature of Christ flows through us and we pray Father God that we will not give in to those sexual desires and passions and the lustful things of this world and we pray oh God that we will desire for things that are holy God that we will desire for things that are righteous that we will walk in accordance with your will and your word Father God we thank you for hearing our prayer we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. And we ask this in the precious and the peerless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you so much, everyone. Have um, a good time, supernatural hour and lunch. And I'll see you in the afternoon section. Thank you, um, online students, for joining us. God bless. Thank Excuse you. me, ma'am. Daniel Oliver, are you still in class? You've asked, you've asked me a question, ma'am. Is it wrong? to buy costly cars like 50 lakhs or one crore. I think if God has um, provided you excess of funds, then you can go ahead. But then I think if you, 50 lakhs and one crore is huge amount of money. You can buy a car that fits your family and you can give the rest to extension and the building of God's kingdom. Yeah. Does that help Daniel? Yeah. Hey Lucy. Thank you for the heart. Amen. Excuse me, ma'am. I had a question. See you in the afternoon session. Bye. Bye. Thank you.